So we're pleased to have tonight uh, Mr. Peter Hemingbury with us, and he will give us the address entitled The Bible and the Archaeologist Speak. Well, thank you again. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. I'm fairly loud, as a uh, matter of course, so uh, uh, if anyone can't hear me, raise your hand and I'll speak even louder. Anyway, uh, tonight is a topic that's uh, fascinated me for, uh, uh, for a long time because uh, uh, it, it's quite fascinating, it's quite inspiring, it's quite encouraging that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, despite the length of time that's occurred since most of the, uh, since all the events, especially in the Old Testament, uh, that, that people still keep finding evidence and, uh, and uh, uh, things that are relevant to establish the uh, validity of the, uh, of the events that are recorded in, in the Bible. And really this is what we're going to talk about, the evidence of the people and places mentioned in the Bible. We're not going to talk about the archaeology of Jerusalem or, or uh, any of the other uh, topics that might be relevant. What, what we're talking about is, is the evidence and, and the way in which, in which uh, uh, the, uh, the people and the places mentioned in the Old Testament are also mentioned in contemporary uh, uh, artifacts, in contemporary records. Uh, it's kind of surprising, you know, that uh, obviously if uh, someone does archaeology around here and they're they're doing archaeology of the Civil War and finding mementos of the Civil War. What we're talking about here is, is archaeology of events that took place uh, at least 2,000 and sometimes 3,000 years ago. And as you can imagine, most of the evidence is, is buried completely. In other words, if you walk around Jerusalem and, and they say this is where Jesus walked, it's almost certainly not true because he almost certainly walked about 20 feet down because Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt uh, so many times since then that, that you have to dig a long way down. And, and this is, the, this is the, the results of the digging is what we're going to talk about. Really, um, we, talk, we need to establish some parameters, first of all, about faith and archaeology in the Bible of, uh, and archaeology. Faith comes by the word of God. It does not come by observation of nature it doesn't, of, uh, and of the earth and of the heavens. It, it can't even come from archaeology. Uh, obviously, if you could prove that the Bible is true, uh, you wouldn't need the Bible, because basically you're referring to some reference that's, that's higher and, and, uh, and more valid than the Bible, and you can't do that, because the Bible is, uh, we believe, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate reference. It cannot prove that the Bible is the inspired and infallible Word of God. What it can do um, is it can strengthen our faith as we see the events and statements of the Bible repeatedly proven to be true by third party confirmation, many of whom really don't believe in, in the truth of the Bible. They're just archaeologists. There's a whole group of archaeologists and a whole subculture which which is sort of the uh, minimalist school, uh, uh, we say that most of the Bible is, is not true. And then uh, every so often, uh, one of their statements is, is proven to be untrue. It's kind of hard to prove anything from silence, but it's very easy to prove something by a, by a physical artifact from the time. It, of course, it enhances our knowledge of the economic, cultural, social and political vibe background of Bible events, but we're not going to be talking about that very much. Uh, really what, what we're going to be concentrating on is the, is the uh, proof that, of the events and the statements of the Bible. And it also gives exciting clues to the lives of, of real people. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you can see a thumbprint of, of one of the uh, folks mentioned in the Bible in one of the uh, little seals that we'll, uh, that we'll show a little, a little bit later. The information of the Bible has been verified repeatedly. To these scholarship has a radically new attitude toward the chronological data for, uh, for 
provided in the Bible, isn't it? But if someone is really uh, interested, I have a, a few copies of, uh, of sort of a kind of handy dandy little uh, little uh, handout of, of who lived when and where. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if someone. Can you. Uh, and the map, it's just we could have sure. the hand on the map before, but, uh, but obviously. <laughs> so, so, really, obviously, what we're going to be talking about essentially is the uh, events mostly of, uh, of 1000 BC to, uh, to around the time of Christ. This is what we're going to be fo focusing on because this uh, uh, most of the time, because this is the uh, this is the accounts of the uh, of the nation of, of Israel. So we're going to be talking first of all uh, about uh, uh, archaeological finds. But uh, before we do that, uh, it's always interesting as to how many Old Testament people have been found by archaeologists. In other words, of, of all the people mentioned in the Bible. How many have been found in contemporary records uh, by name? You know, 10, 20, 40, 50, 100. Anyone like to guess? Okay. I, I happen to know because the answer is approximately 50. And obviously we can't uh, cover all of them, but we're going to uh, uh, give a reasonable uh, Approximation to uh, to some of them. I mean, it's kind kind of staggering. And if you look at the uh, look at the uh, um, the distribution, indeed, of all the people that are, that are mentioned, uh, there's 50 of them, and they go from David, who is number 21, to uh, uh, to Cyrus, uh, who uh, who uh, uh, let the children of Israel uh, go back into the land. Is number 50. You can see there's there's several clusters, but it's uh, it's kind of interesting that they spread over a, a long period of time, you know, a, a period of time of 600 years. If you think back 600 years in this country, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1400, what was it? 82. 82, whatever. I mean, that's, that's about 600 years ago, you know. And if you go down to, uh, uh, is there any trace of Columbus left in this? In this? Uh, anyone find any trace of Columbus? No, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, that, that people have found so many uh, records. I mean, uh, we're going back a little bit for that because this is with the people and we're starting off by talking about places. I mean, the first place that, uh, that uh, of note, that's of interest to us is, is the fact that, uh, that Jerusalem is mentioned, uh, you know, uh, 1800 or 1900 years before Christ, which is about 3,000 years ago. Of course, at the time, Jerusalem wasn't the, the capital of Israel. That didn't happen until, the, until the, an awful lot longer than that. It didn't happen until around 1000 BC. But certainly Jerusalem is, is mentioned uh, in, as, a, as, a, as one of the enemies of Egypt in, in 1800 uh, BC, uh, approximately, which is, you know, it's one of the places mentioned, and this is the oldest mention of Jerusalem that people have found. The other thing that's interesting while we're talking about Egypt and Egyptian is the in Egyptian Brit. Uh, you, you can, uh, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a sort of petrified uh, uh, version of, a, uh, of an Egyptian brick, obviously, if it's made out of clay and mud. It, it, it doesn't have an infinite life, but, uh, but people certainly have found them. And, and this, is, uh, this particular one is uh, dated back to the time of Israel enslavement in Egypt, which is about 1400 or 1500 uh, BC. They've also found a small number of bricks made without straw. And they are believed to be a result of Pharaoh forcing the children of Israel to make bricks without, without straw. And, uh, and it's kind of interesting that in the most recent issue of the uh, Biblical Archaeologist Review, I think I got it, uh, uh, there's, there's a little article about this, and they, uh, uh, they actually made uh, bricks with and without straw, and they, uh, uh, they confirmed absolutely that uh, bricks without straw were terrible bricks, 
they slump, they don't hold their, 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 their side, they're real hard to use, which is sort of emphasizing the, uh, the trouble that the, uh, that the uh, Jewish people, the children of Israel had in, the, in, the, in the, uh, uh, because really, really they had to gather scorn instead of providing it for them because you can't make bricks without straw. And this is a, uh, a, a little freeze from a, uh, from a one of the uh, tombs in Egypt from about the same period of time. And it shows the people very busily making uh, bricks out of, uh, you can see them pouring it and pouring it into bowls. And, now, I'm not going to go through it, I can spend quite a little time talking about it, but it, it's a very clear demonstration that, uh, of how people were making bricks in, in that time. So, uh, so now we're on to, uh, in, coming on in time to the uh, period of the Exodus. Uh, no one has yet found a, uh, any real good archaeology, archaeological evidence uh, uh, from, from the... Uh, the Sinai Peninsula, where the uh, children of Israel uh, wandered for uh, uh, for 40 years, but 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 what they have found is that uh, is that the uh, uh, is that the uh, Egyptian records of other times do in fact confirm that the people that the uh, that the Exodus refers to uh, are indeed uh, places that uh, that were in existence by that name at the time of the uh, of the Exodus. So it's. Uh, it's very clear that the Exodus was written, uh, you know, soon after uh, 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 the book Exodus but it was written soon after that time when people really knew uh, what, where those places uh, were. Uh, the, the next uh, one we're coming, coming across is a, is, a, is a little slab that we could have first referenced outside the pages of the scripture to, uh, to the nation of Israel. Uh, it says on one of the lines, which uh, down here, uh, that Israel is, uh, is devastated, having having no seed. So this is a uh, uh, this is a um, uh, by far the oldest record of the uh, outside the Bible that proves Israel's uh, early existence. It's uh, it's kind of interesting that if you actually blew that picture up, you'll see all these all the little hieroglyphs. And, uh, and then if you uh, actually uh, uh, sort of uh, do what people do, which is uh, make uh, representations of them, uh, uh, this is what the hieroglyphs say. And if you're an expert uh, Egyptologist, you can read that with no problem, because it said Israel foreign people. Uh, I have to take uh, Egyptologist's uh, word for it, uh, uh, but, I, uh, but I certainly do. Uh, I knew uh, a... Anyway, uh, and a friend of mine actually was an Egyptologist who, uh, who could do this sort of thing and did this sort of thing uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite routinely in the, uh, in the British Museum. So now we come to, uh, uh, to another well-known event uh, where uh, in fact the, uh, the person isn't mentioned by name but the, uh, but the event surrounding the, uh, uh, the death of Samson is illustrated because Samson said to the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer that me that I might feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I might lean upon them. And, and of course, Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the, uh, which the house stood. And it's, uh, once again, the archaeologists have, uh, have, have found the Philistine uh, temples in the. In the, uh, uh, in the um, Near, near, near Tel Aviv, and both uh, share a unique design. The roof was supported by two central pillars. You can see these two uh, central pillars uh, in, in the middle there, and you can just see, uh, just, uh, just almost, uh, it's seeing your mind's eye, stand, 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 standing there and plucking these two uh, uh, pillars apart. So it's, you know, it's an, a nice illustration of the, uh, of the validity of, of the Bible. Uh, the next uh, artifact we're going to be talking about is something called the Misha Stella, which boasts upon a, a victory by the 9th century Moabite king Misha over the Israelites. Uh, 
monument also known as the Moabite stone, and we call it Media Color, uh, conquered Israel, Israelite territory east of the Jordan, who humiliated the tribe of Gad. And, the, and, we, and it also can have a possible reference to the house of David, or that a little bit disputed. And if you uh, turn to your Bible later and, uh, and refer to uh, the record in 2 Kings 3, it said very clearly that uh, about that time the Moabite king uh, rebelled against the, uh, the yoke of, uh, of, I think it was uh, Jeroboam, and, uh, and uh, this is indeed is, uh, is what the, uh, this Moabite stone is recorded. So uh, once again we have the events of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Bible confirmed. Now, uh, the other event that's fairly well known is the, uh, is the uh, Sennacherib siege of, uh, of, uh, of Jerusalem, uh, uh, this cl six-sided clay prison, and inscribed with the uh, eighth military campaign of Sennacherib, another name that's, uh, that's, in, the, uh, that's, in, the, uh, that's in the Bible. The, the well-known passage is uh, that Hezekiah, another name, uh, did not submit to this Syrian yoke, but he shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a trap, which basically is said that he uh, shut him up in Jerusalem, but it also doesn't say, I can assure you, that he, that he conquered uh, Jerusalem because, uh, because the, uh, the, the way that the uh, uh, memorial tablets were inscribed is that they took every opportunity to boast of their exploits and they certainly never mentioned their, uh, their defeats. Uh, so basically the very fact that uh, Sennacherib didn't boast of the conquering of Jerusalem is a, is a validation of the event recorded in the, in the Bible where, uh, where uh, Hezekiah uh, and, uh, and Jerusalem were, were miraculously saved from the might of the uh, Assyrian army. Uh, and if you, again, if you uh, don't have time to turn up these references, but you look in 2 Kings 18, you can see the, the whole event. And, uh, and it's also recalled that Hezekiah paid tribute to, uh, at the same time. It's interesting the three versions of like this. One is in Chicago. And I uh, did go and see it one time when I was in Chicago. So it's nice to know that not all this stuff is to be found in the British Museum or the Cairo Museum or the machine in Jerusalem. There's that one in, uh, one in Illinois of these, which is, you know, which is nice. So, uh, uh, and part of this uh, Second Kings 18 uh, talks about uh, the king of Assyria, St. Tartan, and Rav Sarat and Rav Shaker from Lake to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem and they went up and came to Jerusalem. And it's kind of interesting that, uh, that the Assyrians uh, actually uh, um, named their years by the, uh, by the year of the most important figure of the year of the time. They called an eponym list. Kind of interesting if it is that who who you name this year by or last year name by or 2008 hold hold your hand up if you want 2008 to be named after you anyway uh, uh, the, the, this is a Syrian list that they were named the names include Tartan and Rabshaka the two men which appeared with Rabshaka before the wall of Jerusalem so I have another couple of people that were mentioned in in the, in the, in the before the wall of Jerusalem, although it is likely that both named the title, it's not certain that they were actually the name of the people themselves. And then, and then uh, what we're talking about events at the same time, uh, and, and thus after this, this inaccurate king of Assyria sent his servant to Jerusalem, but he himself laid siege against Lachish and all his power with him. And uh, so, uh, so uh, Lachish fell. And, uh, and, uh, and you can uh, you can see in the uh, in the uh, in the latest reliefs that there's, there's a whole long series of them. But here is here is this part of the latest relief of Sennacherib repeating the capitulation of the city. Sennacherib, king of the world, king of Assyria, 
on his seat he sat, <coughs> and the booty of a lake is passed before him. And you can see, uh, uh, you can see uh, Sennacherib uh, sitting there on, on his throne with uh, his people behind him, holding uh, fans to keep him cool, and uh, and uh, and uh, you can see people uh, coming coming before him. How oh, you can see that? The, 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 the best I could do with the uh, with the relief. It's not particularly easy to uh, to see, but you can see the writing up there, which is translated into uh, into these words. If you know, if you know, uh, if you know a Syrian uh, writing of the time, which again I don't. Uh, so uh, so now we uh, now we're still talking about places. We're talking about events roughly at the same time. And this Hebrew Ostrakhan, that's a, uh, that's a, uh, some writing on a, on a clay pot. Um, uh, people, you didn't have pencil and paper in those days, you know, the write, writing implement was somewhat re restricted and what you had to write on was, a, was somewhat, uh, somewhat hard, what people did in those days. Obviously, it, it took, took, a, took a, a little bit longer than people had to chisel the, uh, chisel messages on the, into stone. So what they what they actually did is they inscribed them using uh, using uh, uh, whatever they could onto uh, onto pieces of, uh, of pottery, and then they sent these pieces of pottery along. And this 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 particular one is direct to the commandment of the Arab fortress, uh, asking that. Reinforce and present him. We need to rely on the Israelite commander with another fortress, lest Edom could come. And uh, these are, uh, and, and this uh, testifies the threat Edom posed to southern uh, to southern flank. Again, this is around the time of Hezekiah, and uh, and our leader is sitting here. You can see Edom is the uh, the territory of Edom is just over the other side of Jordan. And, People don't normally call me this time of night. I must apologize for that. I've got to silence my phone. There we go. Now they sound. Okay. So, uh, so uh, uh, this, this again, uh, a place uh, of, uh, of uh, to uh, demonstrate the validity of, uh, of the Bible. I mean, the other, the, the next thing is that uh, uh, so, what well, it says in First Kings nine and for. Uh, Fifteen is that uh, is that Solomon rebuilt uh, uh, three cities: Hazor, Megiddo, and Giza, and uh, Yigal, Nadim, with the Roman and archaeologists discovered that all three cities had identical gates and walls. The gates all have six chambers and are plastered with benches along the side, which is perhaps not to be surprised when you think that, uh, that obviously if you got one design uh, done, uh, you. Uh, you know, you, you replicate it. And so it seems to seem evident of the fact that Solomon built built them all and built them all to the same uh, to the same. Uh, and you can see uh, another view of the uh, that people have. Uh, you can see the gate. You can see all these uh, these walls. Uh, the two the two different places. And you can see that they have very similar uh, layouts. So. Um, now we get. Now we come along to the uh, silver of Tarshish, where the king's ships went to Tarshish with the slaves serving their harem every three years. Once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory apes and uh, and peacocks. So it's always a bit tricky as to uh, figuring out where you get ivory apes and peacocks all in the same place, but that's a, that's a subject of another. Uh, of another discussion. But here we have a silver of Tarshish to the house of, uh, of the Lord, to the house of Yahweh, <laughs> pursuing to the order to you of uh, Asher the king, to given by the hand of Zachariah, silver of Tarshish to the house of, the, of Yahweh, uh, three shekels. So, uh, so here we have a uh, silver of Tarshish uh, uh, recorded. And, uh, so, so now, having sort of uh, mostly talked about uh, places, we're going to be talking uh, for a few minutes about people. Some of the 50 people that we uh, we referred to uh, early, 
and obviously we're first starting with the, with the, with the, with the oldest record, which is the House of David. How be it, the Lord will not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he made with David and he's promised to give a light to him and to his son forever. And here we have the house of David recorded in an Aramaic victory stealer which he discovered at Tel Dan, inscribed on the tailor is afraid, Bake David or the house of David. And it's, it's interesting because obviously uh, people... Um, uh, the nihilists were saying that uh, both David and Solomon were figments of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the writers to the, uh, of the Old Testament and they weren't real people at all. And then we have, and now, now we have a, 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 an Aramaic victory stealer um, uh, which, which talked about victories and it talked about the problem they had with the house of David. So it, pretty clear that David was a pretty significant uh, individual uh, at the time uh, 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 and obviously the, the, uh, the, uh, this uh, particular victory stale of his date from, from back, uh, not quite from the, house of the, uh, from the time of David but from a hundred or so years later when clearly David's descendants were in, uh, were in uh, full control. Now are we talking about David? Why not Solomon? Here we have Solomon's seal. One side of this cylindrical seal used to stamp a pickle document. We'll talk about seals quite a bit later because we'll figure in a lot of the names. Uh, the spelling Shalomu, Sh the Hebrew name for Solomon. On the seal, the other side, a royal figure bearing a scepter is, uh, is, is depicted. The figure skirt like garment. Garment is recognized, is reminiscent of the ephod that recorded as being worn by uh, by uh, King David. So we have uh, have uh, have the uh, the uh, Solomon, and about the same time we have a uh, another person mentioned in the uh, in the Bible. This time it's Shisha, king of Egypt. He came up against Jerusalem when Rehoboam was king. And he took away treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And, uh, and what, uh, what, uh, what, the, uh, what the son of Shishak then did is he, uh, is he took uh, all the gold that he could lay his hands on and, uh, and uh, uh, put, uh, uh, put them in, uh, in, uh, in the... Uh, in the pyramid, or at least a burial mound that, uh, that he made, and here we have a, a bracelet of, uh, of the son of, uh, of, of Shishak, a gold bracelet which belonged to Shishak's son. He was the one who uh, squirreled all this gold away, a lot of it. And, uh, and it may well be that this, uh, this, uh, this particular uh, bracelet could well have been made of the gold taken from, uh, from uh, uh, the house of Yahweh in, uh, in Solomon's time. Again, Shisha, uh, mentioned in the Old Testament, a real, a real person very clearly. And, and here we have um, the hieroglyphics in the center of this Beatles sketch seal, Salab Yabkar, the Egyptian transliteration of the Semitic name Yakub, one form of Jacob. So here we have Jacob being, uh, being mentioned in uh, in a uh, in a uh, in a scarab uh, uh, a seal, uh, and again uh, we, uh, this is a theme. We're going to be talking quite a bit about seals, because obviously what people did in those days is that, is that instead of signing a uh, a, uh, a document, uh, they'd have the scribe write it. Most of the important people were, uh, either couldn't write or didn't want to write. And then, the, then they take their official seal and stick it in a, uh, into a, uh, a, a lump of clay, which, which would seal the envelope. I mean, people did that until the, until the, uh, fairly recently, uh, a wax seal on the, on an envelope. And certainly into the uh, 19th century, uh, this, this is a picture uh, uh, which. Uh, Unfortunately, it's been missing since uh, soon after discovery in, uh, in 1904, but it refers to, uh, to uh, uh, Shema, servant of Jeroboam, 
so here we have uh, the Jeroboam being, being mentioned in the in the Old Testament, and here we have uh, Jehu, son of Omri, silver, a gold, a golden gold, a golden beaker, slave for the hand of the king. I, Salamansa, received them from him. And this this event is referred to in uh, 2 Kings 9, verse 14. And, uh, and people uh, often wonder whether this person kneeling on the floor is actually a Jehu, in which case it's the only representation of a king of Israel that, that we have. And there's a, a lot of a dispute about that, but I personally think it probably is Jehu, I like to think, think of him. Which is who is famous, of course, for, uh, for driving, uh, driving rapidly. You know, and obviously uh, yeah, that's how that goes to this day and age of people driving rapidly. So a uh, geek who is fairly well known in certain circles as the, uh, as the model of, uh, of the drivers around Detroit. Not this time of year because he's too busy dodging the pothole. But uh, certainly uh, when, it, when it's, uh, when it's uh, nice and sunny, eventually uh, you'll see people driving like geek who. So uh, Hoshir, the son of uh, of, of Eli to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years, one of the uh, one of the minor kings of uh, of the uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Israel. Uh, you'll find him mentioned on that handout I gave out, just to uh, uh, put some in the context. And here we have uh, a seal of uh, Abdi, servant of uh, Hoshea, of, uh, kind of a fancy seal. This, this is really what they looked like. And we have a lot of these seals, but we don't have very many of the uh, of the holder. But this is a uh, this is a seal holder, and you can see the uh, uh, the seal. And uh, Abdi was the ministry of King Hoshea, the last king of uh, of uh, Israel. And so uh, uh, this this uh, this is a blow blow for that particular seal that apparently was sold. Uh, in 1993 for 80,000, so these days it's probably worth half a million, so, you know, fairly valuable uh, seal. So, uh, uh, and coming on to the to this seal, we have uh, Zedekiah the minister. This seal is approximately, it's kind of small, 0.4 of an inch, you know, a centimetre uh, in diameter, and it's described in ancient Hebrew script with the name of Yehoikal ben Shalamar. Ben Shaivi, or Yehukal, son of Shalemiah, and he, he, he no, noble who, according to Jeremiah 37 verse 3, was sent by King Zedekiah to Jeremiah with a message asking the prophet to pray for the Lord for us. At the time when Jerusalem was attacked by Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar, you know. So, it's, so we have some sort of a minor figure, you know. I mean, how many people would would if you? If you if you said that Jehu who was Jehu killed son of Jeremiah, be able to say put up your hand and say I remember him, you know. But but here we have a uh, have his name recorded from uh, from uh, all those years ago, and it, and there's quite a few of these of of, of minor people that uh, that uh, suddenly uh, come along, uh, you know. It's, uh, we have uh, the other wire, the son of. Hilkiah, and he is the seal of Adariah, the son of uh, Hilkiah. Um, here we have uh, uh, Hilkiah, the high priest, as he came from the secretary, I found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord, and he gave it to Shaphan, who read it, which is a fairly famous event when uh, when the uh, when the book of the law was uh, was uh, was rediscovered after. Uh, uh, after not being read by anybody apparently for several, for several hundred uh, years. Here we have another one, Hannah, son of Hilkiah, the ring the instruction we be belonging to Hannah, the priest, and the ring still holds an agate, uh, an agate seal. Here we have a, he's a, he's a, a king. So Isaiah slept with his father, and they buried him with his father in the field of the burial which belonged to the king, for he said, he is a leper. And here we have the funerary inscription of Isaiah, king of, king of Judah. Hither was brought the, 
brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah, do not open because, because although they were prepared to move uh, the bones uh, in a place, they, they were so afraid of leprosy that there didn't anyone uh, uh, touching, uh, touching the bones. Then we have uh, Jeremiah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe. Um, uh, then with Baruch in the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Jer Jeremiah the son of Shaphan the, the, the scribe and there we have a, you can see a whole collection of these, these seals which were found in and around Jerusalem and here we have one of these clay um, artifacts obviously whatever the, uh, the seals is long gone but the clay uh, uh, still, uh, still left um, like I said, Jeremiah was a prominent member of King Jehoiakim's court, um, so, so he was a fairly important person. Then we have uh, uh, one which I quite like, then Jeremiah called Barak the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote from the word of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken into the roll of a book. And here we have a, a, another seal with a, with Barak, son of, uh, of Neriah, which is interesting. And uh, you see these, uh, this uh, fingerprint off to the top, well, well, your left, my right, with a fingerprint there, you know, which uh, I'm sure if you were a uh, CIA or FBI person, you could probably take that uh, fingerprint and run it through your, uh, your record and uh, hopefully it wouldn't come up with a map because it belongs to a uh, to Bayrak and he pressed the seal upon the, upon the document uh, about two and a half thousand years ago or so. So, uh, you know, it's a kind of an old fingerprint that still, uh, that still exists. And here we have a, uh, Jeremiel, uh, the son of Hamalak. We have an awful lot of these, as you, as you can see. Uh, here we have a Neb uh, Another of these minor characters, and it's uh, there's an interesting story about this. This is how Jerusalem was taken. This is from Jeremiah 39, verse 3. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and took seats in the middle gate. Nergal Shereda, Nebo Sarkasim, a chief officer, Nergal Shereda, a high official, and all the other officials of the king of Babylon. I mean, obviously, how many people, if there was asked who, uh, who Nebuchadnezzar was, they would have, you know, probably not too many people remember the name. However, there was an uh, Egyptologist who, uh, who was uh, studying uh, these, uh, these receipts in the, uh, in the bowels of the, uh, of the British Museum in London. Uh, you go down there, so I'm told I have never been given permission there. Uh, uh, but uh, my Egyptologist friend used to spend a day a month there. Uh, you've got hundreds and thousands of these of these uh, clay artifacts, uh, which were covered in the um, most of them in the 19th century. And so, so we have uh, some Egyptologists sort of uh, just reading this uh, this uh, uh, receipt, and obviously it's written in the. In an Assyrian script, which probably only about ten people in the world can can uh, recognise, but this particular individual remembered the name and said, you know, "Can you imagine the uh, the excitement when he uh, when he saw the uh, this receipt written, but from uh, from uh, uh, from the right period, mentioning the name he remembered from the." Uh, from Jeremiah 13 verse 3, you know, obviously no one ran computer, computer comparison like they might do in these days, because this was, this was about 40 or 50 years ago before the advent of computers, so it relied upon human uh, memory. So here we go, fragment of received from a payment by, by a, fi uh, a figure in the Old Testament. Uh, so uh, this is going back from, uh, to 587, uh, BC, and uh, and uh, we have another uh, brother from uh, uh, Sarah, the son of, uh, of Jeremiah, another uh, individual from uh, Jeremiah. Uh, it's not entirely surprising that uh, there's a lot of seals uh, exist from those days, because obviously when the, when Jerusalem was sacked uh, during the time of Jeremiah, uh, they burnt the place. And, 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 base, 
basically all the all the debris was buried upon a, a, under a, a pile of, of rubble, and of course the uh, the seal being made of clay would survive the fire mostly, and, and so they uh, they survived to be uh, dug out two and a half thousand years later, and uh, this is uh, this is what they did. So now uh, uh, we'll uh, talk. Uh, We'll talk a few minutes about ancient manuscript, just a very few minutes. Uh, um, going forward. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And here we have a, uh, a silver scroll from, uh, from the... Uh, Found in, uh, in 1979, which is 2,600 years old. So this particular silver scroll antedates the uh, the Dead Sea Scroll by uh, by uh, several centuries, and is certainly the oldest extant uh, uh, piece of the uh, uh, of a biblical text um, uh, that we have. This priestly blessing, which is meaningful. So up to us was so significant two and a half thousand years ago. This is worn around the neck with a leather strap close to the heart, and obviously we know that observant Jews these days wear phylacteries on their uh, on their foreheads, uh, which uh, which have some of uh, some of the uh, the same words. Of course, the Dead Sea Scroll. You could do a whole presentation on the uh, significance and validity of the Dead Sea Scroll. This is a first Isaiah scroll. The thing that's amazing is how close the Hebrew is to the uh, uh, to the Hebrew text, which is the basis of our Bibles, which was actually written down and codified a thousand years later. And the changes that that were made, that have been made, uh, of those who have been made since uh, over that thousand years, are almost insignificant. Uh, it's, it's remarkable the uh, and so uh, now, now uh, we have the uh, old. Uh, we showed you the oldest uh, record of the Old Testament. This is the oldest record of the New Testament. Uh, this picture fragment is, uh, is from John 18, verse 31. And the, and the script is dated to uh, roughly uh, uh, 125 AD, so it's written, so this fragment is, uh, is, is, is at least, uh, it could well be a second generation, in other words, copied from the uh, original, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm English, so it's uh, kind of interesting that this particular fragment is in a, a library in the, in the city where I went to university, so I uh, hide myself down one day and, uh, and have a look at it behind uh, behind uh, bulletproof glass and people standing there making sure you didn't make any move to, toward it. But it's, uh, it's interesting that you can see the actual piece. So now we come into the New Testament, which obviously is, a, is, a, is not nearly so replete with archaeological finds, because obviously the New Testament, at least uh, the Gospel, only occurred under over a period of, uh, of 30 years or so. And so, uh, as you might expect, there's not too much. But certainly we have Caesar Augustus, Gaius Octavius, the first Roman Empire, became supreme ruler in 29 BC and, and named Caesar Augustus by the Roman Senate in uh, 27 BC. He was emperor when Jesus was born, just as Luke 2, two verse 1 claims. Now this one head, kind of the same but the different. Uh, this one head was found in Sudan in northern Africa as it happened. So now we have Tiberius Caesar. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Luke 3 verse 1, Pontius Pilate being governor of Caesar. So first of all we have Tiberius Caesar. And then this, look, I think they look quite handsome, don't you, these, these emperors? Yeah, if one of these walked down the street, you, you wouldn't think anything of it, would you really? You know, these great, fairly decent haircut, you know, clean shaven, you know, not a normal person. So, uh, so here we have uh, Tiberius.
Tiberius Caesar, Tiberius Claudius Nero. So, uh, and now we have uh, Pontius Pilate, discovered in 1962. I mean, a lot of this stuff has only been discovered later. At Caesarea, and secondly, using a later wall. In other words, people had taken this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, building uh, stone and used it in a in a later wall. So it's kind of that is why it, why it survived. Uh, uh, this also settled the debate over whether Pilate's title of prefect was the inferior procurator. And here we have uh, here we have a, a close-up view of it. And here we have a better view. Um, so here we have Tiberium Pontius Prefectus of Judea, uh, which is written in Latin, and uh, you know, this is in a Roman script, and I did Latin at, uh, in, in, in high school, but I can't say my Latin is, uh, is uh, up to snuff because it's a, little, it's a more than a year or two ago. So anyway, we have uh, the pilot inscription, we have point of, of Pontius Pilate that uh, you can see uh, you can see it uh, there we go Judea coin issued by Pilate in uh, 30 uh, AD the Greek inscription reads Tiberius Caesarus of Tiberius uh, Caesar uh, uh, but uh, in the centre is, is a litius, a curved crook used by Roman augurs, or this pagan religious symbol was used frequently a Roman coin minted outside Palestine. Pilate was the only Roman prefect to have put it on money issues for commerce among the Jews, which is why the Jews didn't like him at all. You know, I mean, this was doing something that they totally disproved of. So now we have uh, Caiaphas, uh, they led him, Jesus, away to Annas first, but he was father in law to Caius, uh, Caiaphas. Uh, um, and here we have uh, the, the Caius family burial chamber, which was discovered in 1990. Uh, this considered six, six ossuaries, <coughs> two of which had been robbed. But, uh, but it's interesting that we have the one of Joe, the son of Caiaphas, uh, which has a body of six people, two infants, a child, uh, an adult female, and a man of roughly 60 years uh, six year of age. Uh, and quite who they are, uh, we don't know, but certainly uh, these are the bones of the, uh, of the family of, of Caiaphas. And this is the, uh, the inscription on the side of the book and the back of the Osseo is inscribed Caiaphas' name, Joseph Bar, son of Caiaphas. So now we come to uh, one of the more interesting and I have to say controversial finds of, uh, of the last few years. In, the, in, the, in 2002, the Biblical Archaeology Review uh, revealed that this uh, Osseo uh, uh, had been found and this, this was a burial box of James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, this date has been confirmed to a period of BC 20 to AD 70, so it's a right period. It seemed possible, perhaps likely from the statistics, that it was in, indeed the burial bo bo box of James, the brother of Jesus Christ. And this is, uh, this is what it reads, Yaakov bar Yosef, Aku di Yeshua, which is, uh, which is uh, James, uh, uh, the, uh, the son of Joseph, uh, the, uh, the brother of, of Jesus. Um, it's, uh, this has been a continuing saga for the last decade or so, and the latest event that happened uh, a couple of months ago is that uh, the owner of the ossuary was uh, had been sued by the uh, Israeli authorities for forgery. And about two months ago, he was declared innocent. In other words, there was no evidence of forgery of, of this, uh, this ossuary, which is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, uh, again, it's a uh, controversial topic. Uh, I've been read a lot about it. I tend to think that it's uh, genuine, but I can't. But but I admit that uh, this, uh, this view is not shared by uh, all, everyone in Israel, uh, obviously, because they don't want any, any uh, evidence that, uh, of the importance of, uh, of Jesus or, or, his, uh, or his son. And uh, I think the last thing we 
have is a, is a, uh, is a nice little inscription where we said that uh, where, uh, uh, where there were people were complaining about uh, about uh, Paul having brought a Gentile into the uh, temple by simply on the fact that they saw the two in, in company in Jerusalem and they therefore assumed that he uh, 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 this Trophimus and Ephesian whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the, uh, into the temple uh, and, uh, and then uh, and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us which is a sort of a strange Similarly, until you realise what he's talking about, and this is the uh, the temple warning which which was found, almost the only relic of Herod's temple, which was written in uh, in Greek, and it says, "No foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow." I, I like that. And then, uh, this, this is the uh, this is the wall of the middle temple that uh, Paul was talking about in uh, in in Ephesians. So, uh, and this is the actual inscription uh, that was that was on this uh, balustrade all along. So, if you knew that you were a Gentile, yeah. you knew you, you should know a, a lot better than to cross this uh, this balustrade, this low wall. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. So, uh, and this is the, this is the, I think this is the last one I'm going to uh, show. This is a coin from a second revolt, AD 132 to 135, which shows the, uh, the this depiction of the Jerusalem temple, which was destroyed some, uh, some six years ago, but not actually before this sort of, um, resurrected some sort of, uh, of sacrifice uh, on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the Temple Mount. So we have not followed, so to sum up, all, all that we have been talking about doesn't entirely prove that the Bible is true, but it certainly shows that we have not followed cun cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but what eyewitnesses of his majesty, for we see from God the Father honour and glory, when they came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We also have a more sure word of prophecy, this Bible of ours. Well unto you do well that you take heed of unto a, a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So what we've heard tonight is a demonstration of the, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of the, of the truth of, of the existence of, uh, of so many of the uh, places and, and people that, uh, that we read about in the Bible uh, derived entirely from uh, some of the record and, uh, and the record of the time. And I, like I said, I've always been fascinated by this truth and uh, every, every few months there's another one that I uh, put into my uh, little, uh, little collection and uh, you know, I hope, I hope uh, that the Lord will come until I fin before I finish doing that. So thank you for your attention.